All right, so we are, I'm going to try something different here. Try holding it this way. It might be easier. So we're going to talk about diols. Um, remember, we were talking about how you make alcohols. So we had sodium borohydride reduction of aldehydes and ketones, and then lithium aluminum hydride reduction. Just go back a second. These reactions. Well, these were the mechanisms. We talked about these reactions uh, here. All right, sodium borohydride and uh, lithium aluminum hydride and how they're used to reduce aldehydes and ketones to alcohols. So this is the alcohols chapter, so how you prepare alcohols. And that they're selective for the pi bond of the aldehyde and the ketone because why, was there, why were they selective for the aldehyde and ketone? You guys remember Yeah, because of the charge, like they're polar, the bond is polar. So the hydrogen of the borohydride or the lithium aluminum hydride uh, is attracted to that polar bond. And then one of the things we also talked about is how hydrogen reduction, uh, hydrogens, I mean, think about the, the properties of the molecules are nonpolar, and it's generally attracted to nonpolar bonds, but actually will reduce uh, any pi bond. Okay. So if you want to reduce everything, that's what you can do. Um, also, we talked about uh, the reactivity of sodium borohydride and lithium aluminum hydride. And what, it, what was it? Which one's more reactive? You guys remember? Um, which, which, which is more reactive to... to Carbonyls, LAH or sodium borohydride? Which one? LAH. LAH. You want to say LAH, but why? All right. My pointer's gone. Like I keep a yardstick in here to point me, it's gone. Where are they in the periodic table? All right. Boron and aluminum are on top of each other. So aluminum is much less electronegative. And as a result, the hydride, that, that is this, in lithium aluminum hydride, is much more negatively charged because the aluminum is a lot less electronegative. So that means the dipole for this bond is much more in this direction. So it's a lot more reactive because of that. I only really mention that because, one, I really want you to know. And two, uh, it helps you remember like why it doesn't react with a, like a pi bond, like, like a carbon-carbon uh, double bond. Okay? It's the polarity of the lithium aluminum hydride and the sodium borohydride that, that attract it. But the thing about lithium aluminum hydride that's really handy is it will take carboxylic acid and esters in ex with excess LAH and produce primary alcohols, okay? So you can reduce it all the way down using that reagent, and it's because it's more reactive that it does that. Uh, you can kind of get it to do it with sodium borohydride, but you, that's a commercial process, and they put a whole bunch of sodium borohydride in there, and then they just cook it for a long time, okay? So in terms of, like, if you're doing something in a regular lab, you're not gonna take, like, spoonfuls of sodium borohydride and add it. You'll just take a little bit of lithium aluminum hydride, and it'll do the trick, okay? But you can do it. All right. OK, so now we're going to talk about how you make diols. And one of the common ways to make diols is simply by reducing a diketone or a dialdehyde. All right. And it's a pretty straightforward process. It's kind of what you expect, right? Same reagents do this. The real question is, why do you care about diketones? <laughs> like, like, you would have to have two ketones on a molecule to do that. So, like, when's that going to happen, right? And so, as it turns out, you guys know the reaction that produces these all the time. Let's do this real quick. Ooh, I got an orange pen. Hang on, let me change that to blue. Well, I guess orange is okay. I'll stay on orange. Uh, Let's say you had this molecule, 
and you did this. All right, what does that produce? You guys remember what ozone and DMS produce? Two aldehydes. In this case, two aldehydes. And then if it was like this, it would produce two ketones, right? And it splits. Remember, the trick was you, you draw a line like that and you put the O's like that. And those are the products that you get. And then if you take a molecule that has that in it, and you split that, that's your diketone. Okay? So when you take, or dialdehyde, when you split this, they stay connected. So that's why this is a fairly common, that's why this is a fairly common scheme to have something like this, because you can take a double bond, split it, and they get two carbonyl functional groups, and then you can reduce those down. Okay. Um, yeah, there's a lot of tricks. Anyways. Uh, the other way that you guys are familiar with for producing uh, diols is to use um, a uh, peroxyacetic acid. Sorry, couldn't get the words out of my head. With a double bond. And when you use a peroxyacetic acid, you end up on the double bond producing uh, epoxide. Right? That's the three-membered ring. So after step number one, you're going to end up forming something that looks like this. Let's see, what's my molecule? There it is. Something that looks like this. Okay. Now, the oxygen is on either the top or the bottom of the molecule. This one's symmetric, so it doesn't matter. It could be a, you know, you flip it over. Um, and then when you add the water to it, it's an SN2 reaction. So this is after step one. And then step two will produce that. But it's SN2, which means that the water is going to attack from the backside after the oxygen gets protonated. Because under acidic conditions, the oxygen would have a hydrogen on it. And then the next water molecule would attack from the backside. And that's why you end up getting this anti-configuration to the OH groups. And then the other one using osmium tetroxide produces an intermediate uh, that looks like this. And then the oxygens are out like that. Um, oops, I left my oxygens out of my osmium. Hang on, back up a second. This, is, this happens in a concerted fashion. And because it's a five-membered ring, you have to think to yourself, it could only be attached from the same side. When this thing reacts, then these oxygens are the oxygens of the alcohol functional group. And so they have to be on the same side. So you end up getting the syn dihydroxylation. And these four mechanisms covered chapter 9. Yeah. I think it actually says, yeah, 9, nine and 9, 10. So those are things you need to know, and they should be in your reaction notebook. I don't think I talked about this mechanism, but I did talk about this topic. Okay. Um, is, I forgot what you called it. Uh, um, epoxide? No, not the epoxide. Peroxy acetic acid? Yes. Yeah. It's uh, MCTBA. Yeah. It's a type of it? Yeah. Okay. Oops. I thought it was going to be a different reagent, but it was just the same thing. Just... MCP. Yeah, and that actually stands for metachloropera, no, uh, let's see, metachloroperbenzoic acid. So it's, um, that's what this guy is. The M, that's why I use the lowercase, but a lot of times they use uppercase. Um, It's that molecule. 
Uh, the M actually stands for the orientation of the um, these two groups here. M just means they're uh, on the one and three positions. One and two is ortho, and one and four is para. You might be familiar with that from lab because you had to look at the spectroscopies of disubstituted benzenes. Okay. Um, so now we're going to take a little, it's kind of like a little side trip. Um, it's an interesting place to put it. It, do, it is involved in the formation of alcohols. Um, it's one of the more um, important reactions in organic chemistry. Uh, they're called Grignard reactions, but they fall in a classification known as organometallics. Organometallic reactions. So they include right, the Grignard reagent, which is a, uh, a magnesium organometallic uh, reagent. Uh, and it also includes things like zinc in this week, I think, yeah, we're Tuesday, Thursday. So on Thursday, you're going to start a lab and you're doing the organo-zinc lab. We're actually going to do one of these reactions. Turns out the organo-zinc reactions for what we're doing are a lot easier. I used to use Grignard all the time, but it's really kind of a pain to, like, prepare it and to actually run the reaction. I'll talk a little bit about it in a second. Um, okay, so the way the Grignard reaction works is you take an alkyl halide like... Um, Bromobenzene. So bromobenzene would be something like this molecule that's on the left. This is bromobenzene here. Oops. And then you put it in with magnesium. The solvent for this is usually diethyl ether or some kind of ether. And I'll explain why that is in a second. And this kind of magic occurs. The magnesium inserts itself between the carbon and the bromine. Now, it's not really like magic magic, but it looks like magic, right? Because it's like, hey, how'd that end up in there? So, so what actually happens is, if you remember where magnesium is, it has two valence electrons. It uses one of those valence electrons. And you can see different mechanisms for this online, which is fine, but it does that. So it's a radical reaction, and what you end up making in the intermediate is the radical alkyl functional group and the radical magnesium bromide or the magnesium halide. Um, there's a, this single bond is the result or re result of the initial radical transfer. They're right next to each other, so presumably it flips around, right? and then transfers electron, and then you get this coupling reaction like this, and then the magnesium is between the alkyl group and the halogen, okay? So, so what is important about this? Well, if you think about what this is like, it's a covalent bond. We, we, we think about it when we say, like in, in gen chem, we say, oh, it's a metal, non-metal, so it's ionic. But really, if you look at the electronegativity difference, it's not that big. So it's really actually in the very like polar covalent. Well, what that actually means, and in, in like uh, when you break it down, is it has some covalent character and it has some ionic character. And the bigger the electronegativity difference gets, the more ionic the bond gets. So you can almost think of phenyl magnesium bromide as a benzene ring like this, that this bond that, that I'm drawing right here, and then I'll, I'm going to erase it in a second, like this. This bond really is almost ionic in character. Now, the carbon is going to be more electronegative than the magnesium. So let me erase that bond like this. Ooh, wow, the eraser is a little bit too big. I just erased everything in between. Where this side is positive, and that's behaving like a lone pair, and this side is negative. Okay? And what that allows to happen is that carbon becomes a nucleophile. And in any of the nucleophilic reactions that you can, 
that we've talked about, it can be used as a nucleophile in the reaction. So primary alkyl halides, it can be used as a substitution reaction in primary alkyl halides. Carbonyls, it can be an addition reaction on a carbonyl, just like lithium aluminum hydride. So you think about you know, lithium aluminum hydride, this is a lot like lithium aluminum hydride. There's your metal, right? There's your in a lithium aluminum hydride, this would be hydrogen, right? Now it's just a carbon uh, with a very strong negative charge on it. And so it transfers as a nucleophile. Same thing happens with this magnesium chloride. This would be what, one, two, three, propyl magnesium chloride, right? In terms of oxidation state, there's no change in the oxidation state. It ends up being the same. I'll let you do the calculation for that. Yeah, so we think about this bond, even though it's covalent, essentially being a nucleophile with a cation attached to it. Okay. So R minus, that represents my Grignard reagent. behaves as a nucleophile, attacks this carbon of the carbonyl. Why does it attack the carbon? Right, we talked about this before. It's a polar bond. So it doesn't attack like normal carbon-carbon double bonds, but any polarized double bond, it'll attack. It'll attack at the carbon. And then, you know, so that we don't violate the octet rule, because that's still kind of important. Um, this pair of electrons has to leave. This leaves what we call the tetrahedral intermediate. And what feature does this thing have? It has steric strain. When the groups are in the carbonyl form, this carbon's sp2 hybridized, the distance between them is large enough. There's very little steric strain. Okay. And so what the steric strain often causes to happen is it causes the loss of one of those groups that's attached. But in this case, because the groups are, in essence, all alkyl groups, right, their pKa's are so high that they will never leave. They're really strong bases. They don't want to be left alone. And so they stay attached. And then the second step, you add a proton source. Okay. Oftentimes in these reactions, water is not a strong enough proton source, so we add HCl like six molar HCl, so that's like you know, six moles per liter. The rest of it's aqueous, but we need a strong acid sometimes to make this, uh, make this reaction complete. I'll explain to you why that is in a second. But. So it's very similar to, to lithium aluminum hydride or sodium borohydride. The Grignard reagent attacks the carbonyl and essentially adds across the double bond. Okay. Well, it doesn't have to be bulky, but as soon as it becomes tetrahedral, it has more strain than it was when it's trigonal planar. So that's one of the things that, for example, if you look at aldehydes versus uh, ketones, aldehydes are more reactive than ketones because they don't have that strain. Because in an aldehyde, one of those groups is a hydrogen. So it's so small, there's very little strain, and so aldehydes re react better than ketones do usually. We can actually use that to our advantage. Maybe I'll get around to talking that, about that later. Okay. Hmm. Next slide. Okay, I don't know how to make the next slide go on that picture there. Is it not? Oh, there it goes. Whew. thought I broke it again. All right. So here's the problem, right? PKA 50. PKA 15.7, right? So water is actually a much stronger acid than the conjugate base of a Grignard reagent. So as a result, if there's any water present in this reaction, it's just going to react with it. So it's moisture in the air, moisture on your glassware, 
any of those things causes a problem in this reaction. So when you, one of the, like the difficulties as a reaction then is you have to take all your glassware and it has to be like really clean and then you have to stick it in an oven. You actually have to bake all the water off the glass. And it's surprising like on a 25 or 50 mil round bottom flask that you've washed and you dry it with a paper towel and it looks dry, you can have like a tenth of a gram of water just stuck on it. <laughs> you don't see it, so you stick it in the oven and you actually have to dry it and leave it for like 24 hours before you do it. We used to do this exact experiment in the classroom, and I always had to tell the students, the whole lab period before, wash all your glassware, stick it in a bin, and I would stick it in the oven for a week, and it would come out, and sometimes it would, they, would, they would put a cap on it, and they'd have little water on the edge of the cap, and that would ruin the reaction, because it just gets in there. And the, and the Green Yard reagent's so good at picking up water, that any water that gets in there usually kills the reaction. Okay, that's just one of the problems, um, but easy enough to avoid. Uh, clean the glassware in your drawer and dry it, okay? Um, or add a lot of green yard reagent. That's the other one. Uh, the other one is one of the things it loves to react with are carbonyls, right? So where do you find carbonyls in our atmosphere? Carbon dioxide. So you have to keep the air out of it. So really, if you're doing this, um, what you should be doing is running it under like uh, nitrogen gas. So you dry everything, you purge everything with nitrogen, and then you do everything under, an, under nitrogen gas. But then it's a great reaction because you can do all kinds of cool things by attaching carbons to other things. Okay? Just some examples. Mechanisms are the same. Uh, if you have an ester... You do an excess Grignard reagent, and you can end up with two uh, Grignard reagents added. Uh, if you have a ketone, uh, you get one. When, you, when the ester is the substrate, okay, let me draw the mechanism for you. The reason that you add two, I think, is pretty clear when you draw the mechanism. So let me do that real quick. So I'm going to just make a simple ester like this. So my Grignard reagent essentially is this. From the last slide. So it's the uh, methyl magnesium bromide, I think. It comes in and attacks here. And then you get this. OK. So again, that's the tetrahedral intermediate. It has strain. Okay. So what ends up happening is this bond will collapse. And then it'll kick out this OME group. And then you end up getting this. What's the other thing you get? OME, yeah, the OME minus. trying to make a joke out of this. Like, I was trying to figure out how I could put oh my in there, but I couldn't. Because then it would be oh me, oh my, and then. Sorry. Um, right. Was it necessary? This group, right, is a much stronger base than that is. So it just drives the reaction in that direction. Okay? Now, What, what are you left with, though? You're left with uh, ketone, right? Ketones are reactive to Grignard reagents, or nucleophilic reactions, right? And so it'll add a second equivalent of the Grignard reagent. So the Me minus will attack. And I'll end up with this.
Okay. Now, this has steric strain in it too because I have the four groups, right? But it can't collapse because in order to collapse, it would have to kick off a methyl group. So in essence, at this point here, this reaction is irreversible. It can't go back the other direction simply because the pKa or the base strength of the methyl group that's coming in here, right, it's so strong that you can't kick it off. So even though there probably is like an equilibrium constant there, it's like, you know, 10 to the minus 50 or something like that. It's really small. So then the last step is to add water or HCl. That's usually about 6 molar. And then you end up with this. So supposed to be ME. There we go. All right. So there's a question, right? Uh, actually, this is a stronger conjugate base than water, so why can't you just add water to it, right? So the thing that's, uh, that you don't see here is the OME actually comes with an MGBR attached to it. And magnesium is 2 plus oxidation state, so that means the MGBR has a plus 1 oxidation a total oxidation state or a charge of plus one, okay? When this negative charge forms, one of the things that happens is this Mg group actually rides along with the negative charge, okay? It actually helps to stabilize the tetrahedral intermediate so that it forms a little bit easier. But then what that means is down here, you also have an MGBR. And it turns out that's stable enough that if you just add water, it doesn't come off very well. Because the positive charge of the magnesium partially stabilizes the negative charge of the oxygen. So what you end up having to do is really it's like boot it out by adding HCl to it. Right? Adding the strong acid then helps to protonate. If you think about HCl being like this that helps to protonate this reaction more strongly. And then really what you're comparing is the base strength of this oxygen versus the chloride, and the oxygen is a much stronger base, so it just kicks it off. Okay. Good? Ish? Questions? Yeah, I think I missed where the methyl group of the marker came from. Oh, sorry based on the, on this reaction here. So I was drawing a mini version of this. So this was the Grignard reagent, right? So that's a methyl magnesium bromide. And then the methyl, right? Oh, I see, right, it's like. It's actually, that's what we're dealing with here. That's the methyl magnesium bromide, yeah. So if you, it's kind of, it, we have a hard time visualizing this. I'm going to try to draw it on the chalkboard because I don't think I'm going to do a very good job on the computer. Carbonyl functional groups are flat. So if you think about, like, um, their geometry, like if you drew a, a plane like this, right, it's entirely in the plane. So that makes sense, right? Because you all know it's sp2 and it's flat. So when the Grignard reagent comes in, this is actually right above it. So like we're used to thinking SN2, and so like, oh, it's coming from behind. But it's actually not, because this thing's flat. It doesn't come from down here, because these groups are in the way. Carbonyl functional group and double bonds in general have a lot of space above and below. So when a nucleophile comes in, there's very little to block it. So when this nucleophile comes in like this, right, and this pair of electrons goes like this, this guy's right by it to pick up that charge. And that's why it's stuck, it gets stuck there so easily. And then helps this transition state to go through to the tetrahedral. The, the result, though, is okay. 
It's not really sticking straight up. It's extra huge. Yeah. Yeah. It's just not. I can't draw that. This side still like bonded to the proton. So that's the complex it forms. Right? And then it's and this part is tetrahedral. Now, if you have a group here, like one of these R groups is actually a good medium group, then what actually happens is the straight and the, the tetrahedral intermediate, this it collapses to make the carbonyl double bond, right? That bond's really stable. We've talked about how stable that is before. That bond's really stable, plus this thing has strain in it. And so if this is a good leaving group, then what happens next is this thing will collapse to form this bond, which is stable, plus now I have, uh, let me put the methyl group in, plus the leaving but the, it's the combination, you have stability in this double bond, and you have strain in the intermediate that causes this thing to go forward. There's actually several chapters on this, like in a textbook. Like most textbooks spend at least three chapters on carbonyl reactions because they get to be really crazy. I mean, there's all kinds of things that happen. It's a little bit over the top. So I'm kind of warning you, too, that we're going to cover all this. All right, it's actually in a later chapter, but I want you to know some of this stuff now. Okay. A later chapter. Probably 19 or 20. Yeah. I mean, it's later. We'll cover it in about four or five weeks, probably, or six weeks. It's definitely, well, yeah, because this is week three, right? It's like around the halfway point of the semester or just after we start covering, like, how do aldehydes react? How do ketones react? Now, we're talking a lot about it here. So this is like the, I don't know, the foreshadowing of things to come. I don't know if this sounds ominous. Because <laughs> you foreshadow happy things, right? They never do. It's always like, what would you call it if it's foreshadowing happy things? All right, sorry, I'm not an English major. All right. So uh, take a look at this reaction. And it says, why won't it work? Right. And the answer is actually this. Right. Alcohols are acidic enough that they will react with the Grignard reagent. So if you think about this thing, let me redraw this. Is the orange pen okay, by the way? Or should I do black? Orange is okay? I like orange because, well, it's not black. Sorry. And you think about this like this, okay. then what happens is it'll just go like that. And so then you'll end up with and then it never reacts with anything, right? So the question is, if you wanted to add this to this carbonyl, how do you do it? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to paint a picture for you, OK? So you, you, literally, you're painting your house, right? Hey, who's painted like a window or anything, like actually done any painting? A wall? Yeah, anything, right? So there's this place you don't want to get paint on. So what do you do? What? You put tape on it, right? They call it painter's tape. That blue tape that everybody likes to use, it's called painter's tape. It's because you can stick it there. It's, it's actually fancy masking tape. All right? You create a mask. A mask is so that when you paint with your paintbrush carefully along the edge, you don't actually get it onto the opposing wall or the, next to the frame. So in chemistry, we call that a protecting group. Okay, So the step that you're going to do in order to allow you to do this reaction is to first protect the alcohol. And it's like sticking a piece of masking tape on top of it, OK? And then doing the Grignard reagent, so there's an extra step added. 
Okay, when you're done painting, what do you do with the tag? Take it off. You take it off. So this step's called the protecting step we're going to talk about. And then you also have to have a way to take that off. It's called a deprotecting step. Okay? So we've got to do protection and deprotection. And very much, it's just like putting masking tape on it and then peeling the masking tape off when you're done. <laughs> Part of the reason why I said it this way is because when I looked at this slide, I said, hey, look, that looks like a piece of masking tape. Well, to me it did. So there's a piece of masking tape. You just you have this alcohol and your bromine over here, and you want to use that in a grid yard reaction. So you add a protecting group on here. It's a, it's a physical, like a chemical reaction. You, you, you actually change that structure. You create your grid yard reagent, and you do the grid yard reaction. So this is added to the carbonyl. So in this case, the carbonyl was just like this. And then you deprotect, and then there you have your uh, new compound. Okay, the the protecting group that people use a lot are these silyl ethers. So if you just ignore this part, silyl ether is a silicon-based ether, and ether is just carbon or something, oxygen and something. Right. So in this case, it's carbon oxygen, silicon, and so they call this thing, because of its silicon, it's a silyl ether. This one's trimethyl silyl ether, and I was telling the other class, it's like awesome stuff for your car windows, and it will keep the water from sticking to your car window. So just think about it like glass, right? Then I said, I also said, I don't know how I know this. I used to work with this stuff in graduate school, and I had these bottles of it around. And then I discovered that you could do this. And so I did a lot of literature reading. And so glass, right? if you think about the structure of glass, it has SI groups, and it has oxygen groups on it. So it has these SiOH functional groups on the surface of the glass. So it turns out. The reagent that you use for this would be a silyl chloride. Okay, so this is trimethyl silyl chloride. And what happens is, is the oxygen on the surface of the glass or the oxygen on the functional group, the alcohol functional group, will attack the silyl chloride in an SN2 fashion. So quite literally, does that and kicks that off. So on the glass, what that does is it makes the surface of the glass very nonpolar because you have these M, the methyl groups, the alkyl silyl group on top, right? Super nonpolar. So when you pour water on the glass, it just rolls right off. It doesn't stick. The reason water sticks to glass is because, right, it's polar. It has hydrogen bonding on the surface, and you pour water on glass. It usually clean glass will get wet very nicely. Uh, we used it to make electrodes with it. Now there's a product that you can buy. It's called Rain-X. You guys ever use Rain-X on your car? Oh, you have to try this. Go buy Rain-X and then clean your window with it and then just stuck like, half of it. This is like an advertisement, unfortunately. <laughs> and then spray water on it. And what you'll see is like the side that has the Rain-X on it. There won't be any water left on it. The other side will have water beaded all over it. So I used to put this on my car windows. <laughs> And you could drive in the rain. It could be pouring rain down, and it's just flying off your window. You can't actually see it. So never run the wipers or anything. It's just... Anyways, probably shouldn't have been doing that. The original Rain-X was like guys in labs with their silyl chlorides. You, know, you, mi you mix it up in an organic solvent, and you wipe it all over your window. Yeah, it's good stuff. Anyways, I didn't do too much of it, because back then it was really expensive. All right. Side note, then. That was my side note. All right, so this is an OTMS. Now, where have you seen TMS before? Big TMS. TMS. Uh, you know, but the, it's completely different context. TMS. It's a different TMS, but it's very related. NMR? 
Yeah, it's the reference compound for NMR. But in that one, it's tetramethylsilane, and all they're doing is this is replaced by methyl group, and we use that for a reference. So it's very much a similar structure, okay? So this is trimethylsilyl chloride, three methyls, si silicon, and a chlorine, right? You get this OTMS functional group plus uh, the solvent picks up the proton, so that's a basic solvent. And now the alcohol functional group's not acidic anymore. So you got rid of the hydrogen, right? It's now basic. Okay. And, sorry, I'm going to skip this slide for a second. I'm going to skip this slide for a second. You can do reactions like this. Here's their functional group. The protecting step is to use this basic solvent. Uh, it could be like a pyridine as well. Trimethylsilyl chloride. You put this silyl protecting group on it. You can create your Grignard reagent. You just take magnesium and you um, basically crush it and mix it with this stuff into it with some ether. And then you'll end up getting your Grignard reagent. You can add this and then you use uh, water or HCl. And then you can get this functional group. And then, then what you need to do is you need to do another SN2 reaction to kick the oxygen off the uh, trimethylsilyl functional group. Okay. So back up for a second. I'm just going to go to this step here, this last step. Well, that's what you have on it. And then you take something like fluoride, or you can actually use a strong acid, okay? And the fluoride will come in, kick that functional group off. And that'll end up releasing your O from the silyl functional group, and then you can protonate it, and then you have your alcohol functional group back. So let's back up. That's the big picture. Let's back up and look at some of the steps. Because there's like conceptually, this is the source for the fluorine. This alkyl ammonium ion is used to help make the fluoride ion more soluble in the organic solvent. So you, you, the counter ion is um, organic enough that even though it's ionic, you can dissolve it into the organic solvent. Okay. So we're talking about SN2 reactions, right? The reason that you can do this is because even though you can't do it, this is tertiary, right? If it was a carbon, the carbon is so small, the nucleophile can't get in because the methyl groups create too much steric kindreds. With silicon, it's different. Silicon is a much larger atom, and so there's actually space for a nucleophile to attack between the methyl groups just because... The silicon is bigger, okay? Um, there's some other details in there, too, but these are actually probably spaced out a little, angularly spaced out a little bit more because the silicon is bigger, and so they can spread out a, a little bit further. The chlorine's small, so they stretch the space in between. So you get the nucleophilic attack, and then the TMS group has to be removed, and you can do it a couple of different ways. One is just used, I did the fluorine one. You can just protonate this group. And that makes it a lot easier to break off. And again, you can have a nucleophile come in and then break this bond. So that's if you use this, or you can just use fluoride. So either one of those works. Ethers are usually stable down to about a pH of about 1 or 2. And if you get below that, then what happens, it's acidic enough. It gets protonated, and then it gets kicked off, okay? or the ether gets broken. The reason this works with Grignard reagent is because Grignard reagents are super basic. 
if grain yard reagents, if you're trying to do a reagent that's really acidic, then this kind of protecting functional group wouldn't be effective because it would break the cellular ether. Okay. Ah, you know, I am going to skip this. There. Um, let's see, hang on. So we're going to talk about reactions of alcohols. I'm not going to talk much about preparation of phenols. You can skip it. Okay. And I skipped, by the way, I skipped in there. There's a lot of biological stuff. I don't know if you noticed. Those slides never showed up. I just skipped it. I talked about the one important one before. That's the NADH to NAD+. Okay. All right. So um, SN. Uh, so for alcohols, um, we have reactions of alcohols with alkyl uh, with uh, uh, strong acids to produce alkyl halides. For tertiary alcohols, remember that's a um, an uh, SN one reaction because of the carbocation stability. And for primary alcohols, that's an SN two reaction. The whole point, though, if you remember, the whole point of uh, protonating the alcohol functional group is because alcohols are generally not very reactive, and so you have to make them more reactive by uh, inducing a charge on it or reacting it with something else. Um, you can also do uh, SN2 reactions if you use a Lewis acid. Lewis acid, in this case, is zinc chloride. Zinc's a positive metal ion, so it binds, the oxygen binds to the zinc, and in essence, the, it's the same as protonating the oxygen, and it creates a better leaving group, okay? So you essentially stabilize the oxygen, and then you can bring a nucleophile in and replace it, so you can use zinc chloride, and it'll end up producing an alkyl halide as well, okay? We talked about tosylates, so I'm just, this is a kind of a survey, so I'm just going to go through these things. You can use tosylates to produce tos, um, you can use tosyl, sorry, you can use tosyl chloride to produce tosylates, and then when you bring in a nucleophile, you can get an inversion of the stereocenter, right? And then what was the other one? The sulfur in it, right? Thionyl chloride, right? So thionyl chloride is the other one, okay? You use thionyl chloride in pyridine, right? And the reaction mechanism is this. this remember, I told you this is one of my favorites. The oxygen attacks the sulfur. Uh, again, you get this tetrahedral inter type intermediate. It collapses because chlorine is a good leaving group. So this is space similar to what we talked about with carbonyls and esters, right? Collapses to produce this. Uh, functional group, and then what happens is um, the chlorine can come in and attack, and it displaces SO2 gas and chloride, which is stable, and you can produce your alkyl halide. Now, the thing to remember that when you do thionyl chloride in pyridine is that when you do this reaction, when you drop the chloride on to the uh, molecule, it's an SN2 attack. So if it's a stereocenter, you get inversion with the chloride, okay? Like this. Let me draw one out for you real quick. Oops. So let's say this is your alcohol. And then you have SOCl2 and pyridine. What you end up with is that. 
So you get an inversion so that when you bring your nucleophile in, it has the same stereochemistry as the starting molecule. Okay? So if you bring in a nucleophile at this point, and it attacks SN2 style, you'll end up with this. So the goal of using thionyl chloride with pyridine is so that you get a retention of configuration, and usually with posylates, you're getting an inversion of the configuration. Okay, so it's controlling stereochemistry. So sad. Thank you. Uh, PBR3, similar type of reagent. Um, the mechanism shown here, the oxygen attacks the phosphorus, then the bromine comes in and displaces this, okay? And so you get an SN2 reaction on this. So if you have stereochemistry, you'll get inversion with the bromine. Then you bring a nucleophile in, you'll get retention of the original configuration or return to the original configuration. Okay, so let's fill out what you need to do here uh, in order to do this following sets of transformations. Okay, so for the first step here, what do you need? Tosyl chloride, yeah. Sorry. TSCL, if you want to just write it like that. What's the next one? Like, you know, this is arrow that's up here. It's going back down to here. How would you get it to go from here to here? So if you did OH, what are you going to get? Secondary, right? So anytime you have a secondary leaving group and you use a strong base, you favor elimination. So you have to use water or something like that in this case. It's a poor nucleophile. I'm thinking to myself there's got to be something better, but I don't really know what would be better. So because water is a poor nucleophile, so you also stand the chance of getting some racemization, but what if we did elimination and then Oh, well if you did elimination, you would end up there's two, two possible products, right? You get a double bond on the left or a double bond on the right. Neither one is more stable. And then as, when you, so you have two double bonds, and then you do a hydration reaction, you'll end up with three different products. The OH will be in the middle, it'll be on the left, and it'll be on the right. So that, can't do that. And then uh, for that last step, how did that happen? Right it? Thionyl chloride? Right. Why did I choose SO? You said it, uh, HCl. Why did, but if you do HCl, right, then you get the, a very good leaving group. Water is a really good leaving group, and it leaves. So you get a carbocation, and then it becomes racemic. Um, when you do the tosyl chloride, um, the chloride is not a strong enough base to displace the tosylate group. All right. So the chloride, like when you think about here in, in this part of the reaction, the product is actually Cl minus. But Cl minus is not a stronger base than OTS minus, and as a result, it doesn't displace it usually. Okay has to do with the base strength. So isn't there, can you do the PCL3? Yeah, you can do PCL3 too. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry. And thionyl chloride, you have to have, a, it has to be under these. It has to be that. It's actually a really, the thionyl chloride reaction is a lot more interesting than is in the book. If you wanted, like, like mess with your head, look up um, stereochemistry of thionyl chloride on the internet, and then you'll find, like, some people say, 
like the chlorine comes in and displaces. Sometimes some people say it doesn't. Sometimes, anyways, there's another mechanism. And I'm not going to talk about it, but there's another mechanism involved. For now, we're going to be happy to think that it's SN2 because that's essentially how it behaves for us. But you can also get retention and configuration. Um, maybe I'll talk about it sometime. I, I'll make slides, so I. It, it's one of those things like you have to draw it on a board and you have to have really good like imagery to go along with it. I'll just skip it for now. Okay, um, let's see. You can also have elimination reactions with alcohols. Right? It says why is E2, the elimination reaction here, right? Carbocation, right? And then water comes in as a base and produces the um, alkene. It says, why is E2 unlikely under these acidic conditions? It's actually kind of a tricky question because it seems kind of like, well, because it isn't. Right? This is an E1 mechanism. Why is E2 unlikely when you do acid catalyzed eliminations with um, tertiary alcohols? Or even secondary or at primaries. Why is E2 unlikely? Well, what do you have to have to have E2? You guys remember? You need a strong base. But if you do an acid catalyzed reaction, what's the strong base going to do? It's going to react with the, the acid, and it's not a strong base anymore, right? So that's why E2 is not very likely under these conditions. The, is that to do E2, typically you have to have a strong base or a good base. And then when you add a strong acid to it, because you've got to make the OH a good leaving group, the hydrogen from the strong acid protonates your base, and it's no longer strongly basic. Um, when you do uh, dehydration reactions, like, oops, when you do a dehydration reaction, uh, one of the things we talked about is you have to use concentrated sulfuric acid, you end up getting a more stable alkene right, as the product. And we use concentrated sulfuric acid because if, if, you, add, uh, if you use dilute sulfuric acid, there's just enough water present in the solution that the, the equilibrium favors the left-hand side. Right, but the addition. Yeah, dilute sulfuric acid would be used for addition reaction. Yeah, it's usually for addition reactions. So if you have an alkene, yeah. So dilute is for addition and concentrate is for elimination. Um, let's see. I get tired of just talking about reactions over and over and over again, honestly. Um, you know what we're going to do is we're going to take a little break here because I am a little bit worn out. <laughs>